Should the developers limit the amount of DLCs to work instead of new iteration of titles? Is there some soft limit that... Did somebody say Fox time? Blue Fox? My awesome friend from Perugia, the best city in Umbria and way better than Terni. Wait, who wrote this in the script? What on earth are you doing around here and... Cut, cut. What is this mess? What's going on? This is my channel. How come I'm the guest? Dandots and the dancers. <laughs> What's the big deal, Fox? It's just a different version of the video about DLCs we did in the past. Kinda an alternative history of your channel. Yeah, alright, I can see that. But how is that an introduction to our new video? What? You're not going to tell me you're unaware of alternative history in video games, are you? You must be educated, right now! Roll the intro! How does he keep doing that? Pah, cavolacci. Of course I know what alternative history is, in fact it is quite a fascinating topic, there is nothing more exciting than to think of all the what-ifs of history, what if the Germans won World War II, what if Columbus never discovered America, what if Dandos introduced himself in my videos without shenanigans, all alternative ways history could have evolved by changing one single event. Wait Fox, your explanation of alternative history is a bit simplistic. There are different layers and shades of alternative history than just what-ifs. All alt history starts from a point of divergence, a single event that, because of the butterfly effect, changes all the flow of history. Heck, we would consider alternative history as a spectrum named Dukronias. In one extreme, you have dystopias, a version of the world where the events are much worse than in reality. In the other, you have utopias, where things are much better than in the real world, almost idyllic. Strictly speaking, Ukronia can also define more neutral alt history that don't compare our history with the one of the alternative universe, and has tighter likelihood constraints. Whoa, alternative history is much more complex than I thought, but we are not here to discuss theoreticals. This is a gaming channel after all, so we do need to look at how video games depict them. For dystopias in video games, we can think about the Fallout series, set in America destroyed by nuclear war. For Utopias, we can think of games like Bioshock Infinite, where, while there are conflicts in the plot, the world of Colombia is quite advanced and peaceful. And for Ukronias, uh, what are those again? Come on, Fox, pay attention! Ukronias in video games are many. The easiest way to recognize them is to see if the developers wanted to send a message or to criticize some aspect of our society, bringing it to an extreme. Deus Ex is a dystopia, where cyborgs and the cyberpunk setting are used to criticize capitalism. SimCity 2000 is a utopia, since you could turn your city into an arcology, a theorized building that gives all imaginable services to your citizens. Instead, the alternative paths in an historical strategy game like Hearts of Iron 4 are good examples of Ukronias, because they don't give an implausible boost but only change your ideological allegiances. I see that there are so many ways to depict alternative history in video games, but while we all know what makes a good dystopia and utopia, what does make for a good Ukronia? And now that I'm thinking about it, is there a right or wrong way to depict events that did not even happen? Hey, I didn't think you would have so many questions. Perhaps it's wise for us to probably start the discussion to find an answer to all your doubts and then some more. How do games depict Ukronias? Let's find out! Alright, we've established that there are various degrees of alternative history scenarios, from the barely something changed to the catastrophic alternative universe where, god forbids, you run this channel. But let's get to the more nitty gritty of the discussion by addressing the elephant in the room. How can you evaluate what is a good Ukronia? Well, Fox, you are making me say this. It's your fault. It depends. You see, the first thing to address is what kind of changes are put in place. Are there plausible changes or fantasy ones? The Assassin's Creed saga is from the latter kind, with all those shenanigans about aliens and alien artifacts. Some of Age of Empires 2 campaign, instead, are more down to earth. As an example, the Aztec are able to resist the Spanish conquistadors. Not really realistic, especially in the long run, but still not a full fantasy. So we can say that Assassin's Creed is not a real Ukronia, but more of a fantasy. While Age of Empires 2 Aztec campaign is. And by the way, when I say fantasy, I'm not just meaning magical stuff but also totally imaginary places and countries vaguely inspired by history. So, games like Valkyria Chronicles are not alternative history scenarios, even if the technology and nation represented are very similar to World War II France and Germany. Okay, so Ukronia really needs to be… well, alternative history. 
I think two well-known examples in the gaming world would be Command and Conquer Red Alert and the Kaiserreich mod for Hearts of Iron 4. After all, both games teleport the player into an alternative reality, where the outcome of a great war is changed. Huh, well, they both do have the what-if premise, but I do realize now that there are noticeable differences between the two games when it comes to the realism of the scenario they build. In the Kaiserreich mod, the world building is believable, technologies are roughly the same and the geopolitics of the world are adjusted and justified by plausible events. In Command and Conquer, well, apparently the Soviets won the war because they had mechs and other futuristic technologies in 1942. In this case, the question what if Russia won World War II is answered in a sci-fi way. That's a great point, my dear Fox. However, I would add another layer to analyze a Ukrainian, but I'm actually talking about another spectrum. Given a divergence point from our timeline, what comes next can be quite predictable or creative. By saying this, I'm not addressing how much the alt history is plausible or similar to fantasy like you said, but I'm actually talking about another spectrum, where to an extreme the events are more or less the same but just with different people and countries and to the other, there is something completely new. Playing Hearts of Iron 4, you can have Roosevelt lose the election of 1936 through events. Having as president a Republican instead of a Democrat should change a lot. Instead, you can still have the same foreign policy of supporting the Allies. This is not very creative, we could even say that it's quite predictable. Basically, London is FDR, but with less terminal disease. If instead Trotsky deposes Stalin in the USSR, then he will start World War II with his permanent revolution and that is a big step away from real history. So we can combine these two axes and imagine a Cartesian plane to classify Ukrainians. On the axis we have the dichotomy predictable, creative, that analyzes how much the author of the game was ingenious in creating something different from real history. On the Y we have the dichotomy fantasy plausible, meaning how much suspension of disbelief is required from the gamer to enjoy this alternative setting. Right, so what you and I are saying is that there are two gradients, how plausible or fantasy an alternative history scenario can be, and in parallel how predictable or creative it is. So as we can see from the Carthesian plane on the screen, a game can have a plausible or fantasy premise regardless of how creative or predictable the actual plot is. A game's reason on why a key event in the past changed history is not dependent on how bizarre the outcome is. In other words, apart from the message that Ukraine can bring to the table, either positive in a utopia or pessimistic in a dystopia, the Tzapstein, the how a Ukraine is made, is what we are discussing and addressing with this compass. Put simply, a game can be plausible and creative, plausible and predictable, fantasy and creative, fantasy and predictable, which of course everything in the middle and in the extremes. This way of visualizing how a Ukraine can be made helps to answer the question how can you evaluate what is a good Ukraine, since in each quadrant there is a certain unique way to craft a good alternative history scenario. Exactly, my old Umbrian Fox. Having this classification in mind, we should move from theory to practice. How about trying to bring one game as an example of what each quadrant of this Cartesian plane stands for? In the following block, we'll explain how and why we place each of these four games in our axis. Be prepared, we ball! Starting with the first quadrant, games that propose a plausible yet creative scenario, I think the previously mentioned Kaiserreich suits the bill. That's right, my old fox! The Kaiserreich mod is a very good example of how a Ukraine can be creative yet realistic when developing its world building. <laughs> I'll even say that it offers an alternative scenario of history sublimely made. The timeline is reasonable, since Germany, after winning World War I, does not become no no Germany. Also, the setting is very creative, since developers crafted a complex world derived from that one different event that occurred in history. In the 20 years or so after the Great War won by Germany, we see a plethora of events taking place across the globe not quite mirrored in our own. It would take forever to list all changes, but here are just few examples. France and the UK see communist uprisings based on a Western syndicalism revolution rather than a Leninist view, and the democratic governments of those two nations fled to Algeria and Canada respectively. The United States see deeper and deeper political division due to the shift of powers abroad that causes the outbreak of a second civil war. Mussolini, instead of founding fascism, since northern Italy becomes communist, invents the equivalent of Stalinism, and so on. A least creative approach to structure a world based on the same premise could have fascist France taking Germany's place in leading the Axis after its defeats in World War I. It would have been easy to switch the roles of the losing power with the victors. But instead, in Kaiserreich, we have a much more complex butterfly effect. 
one that is both plausible, since all the lore of the game is explained quite in detail, but also creative. I adore the fact that the developers, or rather, the moderates, really thought in depth how the world changed based on the different outcomes of the war, rather than from our own history. The team decided to go even a step further and make such a believable setting, not to mention a fun mod to play. Speaking of fun games to play, Wolfenstein The New Order and The New Colossus are really good examples of two games that fit well with the next quadrant, Ukronias that are still very creative but less plausible, more fantasy let's say. We have an alternative 1960 where we have crazy futuristic technologies, from bases on the moon, to mechatox, to various high-tech gadgets that clearly take some historical liberties. However, Wolfenstein is very creative since the plot takes itself quite seriously and it lets the player explore a well-developed world dominated by Germany, one that is rich in details. Mechadogs? You mean Panzerhunde? <clears throat> Still, you're right, the world is quite elaborate and contains little details that really are capable of underlining the developer's creativity. For instance, in Wolfenstein the New Colossus, an American fan calls an aged moustache man Mr. instead of mind leader, enraging him and getting accused of being a Jew. This is quite an insight on the cultural shock between the American subject and the German overlord, and also shows an interesting scenario on how aging could influence the already unstable and paranoid mind of the dictator. That's quite unbelievable. I mean, would you imagine if America would be run by a senile guy older than 79? That would be crazy! Truly alternative history. But anyways, going back on track, the world presented in Wolfenstein, while being quite creative in nature, is not very credible. This is not bad writing at all, it's just another way to depict a Uchronia. It's dystopian in an exaggerated way in order to convey its message better. Even if it is a bit of a stretch of the aforementioned magical constraint, a Plague Tale series is a good example of a franchise that is both fantasy and predictable. Just like Wolfenstein, the plot premise take quite a lot of liberties. Not only the Black Death of the 14th century is even more lethal, but also the boy is capable of controlling the infested rats. Total fantasy! Other than that, the course of history seems untouched by this cataclysmic event, and the 100 years war still takes place in the exact same way. Quite predictable and not very creative. <sighs> As you can see, I'm not really a fan of this quadrant at all. I'm not the biggest fan of A Plague Tale, but it does propose an interesting twist not often seen in alternative history games. Firstly, the fact that the history remains unchanged regardless of the new magnitude the plague has is actually not half bad, since it permits the player to immerse themselves better in this world since the historical events remain roughly the same. Second, even if the plot is fantasy and therefore not plausible due to the existence of magic, this still works in the franchise's favor. The fantasy elements combine well with the whole narrative, pivoting around the themes of family, tradition and destiny, linking the folklore beliefs of the people who lived during the epidemic. In our timeline in these dire decades, superstition skyrocketed and people became paranoid about plague spreaders, a fear made real with the magical control of the rats. Lastly, there can be games that are not quite creative with their premises, but still manage to be really plausible. In Expedition Rome, you impersonate a Roman legate during the last years of the Roman Republic. However, the gimmick is that instead of being captured by pirates, Caesar gets killed in action and the players take his place. After that, the game lets you choose different paths for the upcoming Roman Civil War, still managing to be pretty realistic. The premise that the player replaces Caesar, implying that no matter what happens in the timeline there would always be political turmoil in ancient Rome, may not be quite creative. Having said that, in all of the game's endings that we will not spoil, the game is able to construct and fabricate realistic outcomes, endings that are respectful of historical warfare and institutional structure of the Roman Republic. I totally agree! The game tries really hard to represent both the political issues and the real functioning of a Roman legion, showcasing a large cast of real Roman historical figures with personality that quite resemble the profile we have about them. And since Caesar is out of the picture, there is still room for smaller differences in the events in which he was the protagonist. These divergences of the timeline are caused by both the player's choices and also because the death of Julius shakes the words up as a butterfly effect, even if he was a pretty obscure character at the time. And that's all of them, these four games sum up our Carthesian plane. There are of course plenty more games that fit somewhere on screen, but we believe these four titles really bring home our visual explanation of Ukronias in games. <sighs> I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm quite satisfied about our conclusion. This Cartesian plane, combined with the spectrum between dystopias and utopias, really perfects our understanding of Uchronias. Damn, I'm going to say it! 
I'm so glad about this essay that I no longer feel the need to make Fox Lights a dystopia. Thank you, I guess. This concept was quite challenging to translate in a YouTube video discussion, but I'm glad that we were able to bring home such a huge topic. There are so many alternative history games, yet so many different ways these games are made, both how structurally their storytelling is written and for the message they want to convey. If you made it this far, I wanted to thank you one too many alternative history times for watching today's video. Hey, hey, the gag is over. This is my channel, not yours. Uh, sorry, I'm the dancers from the other dimension. I'm not used to how things are done here. Wait, what? This is getting too confusing. Anyhow, let us know where you would put in the Carfishan plane your favorite old history game. We hope you enjoyed the lengthy discussion and we wish you a wonderful day. And until next time, arrivederci! arrivederci.